friendship with God. Those movements of the soul that are aroused in profound natures by a spiritual path such as that of Meister Eckhart appear most impressively in the lives and works of Johannes Tauler, Heinrich Suso, and Jan van Ruysbroek. Footnote: Johannes Tauler, 1300 to 1361, German mystic and Dominican. While studying, he met Meister Eckhart in Strasbourg and became one of his disciples. He also knew Heinrich Suso. Because the churches of Strasbourg were closed by the bishop there as the result of a quarrel between Pope John XXII and Emperor Louis XIV, Tauler went to Basel where he associated with leaders of the Friends of God, a popular mystic movement that spread Eckhart's teachings. Tauler's sermons were widely disseminated. They are intellectual appeals to practice detachment from the world and to abandon oneself to the Holy Spirit. They abound in striking analogies and keen observations. Tauler referred to Plato and Proclus, whom he believed had passed on the Christian truth in veiled terms, but was guided most of all by Dionysus the Areopagite. On Suso and Rusbrook, see footnote on page 65. End of footnote. If Eckhart seems to be a man who, in the blissful experience of spiritual rebirth, speaks of the qualities and nature of knowledge as of a picture he has succeeded in painting, then the others appear as wanderers to whom this rebirth has shown a new road. They plan to walk this road, but the end of it seems to them to have been removed to an infinite distance. Eckhart describes the splendors of his picture. They characterize the difficulties of the new road. One must be very clear about the human relationship to higher knowledge before representing the difference between individuals such as Eckhart and Tauler. People are entangled in the sensory world and its natural laws. They themselves are products of this world. They live because its forces and substances are active in them and they perceive and judge the world of the senses according to the laws that govern it and them. When people direct their eyes to an object, the object appears as a sum of interacting forces dominated by the laws of nature. The eye, E-Y-E, itself is a body constructed according to such laws and forces. The act of seeing takes place in harmony with these laws and forces. If we could attain the utmost limits of natural science, in all likelihood we could pursue the play of natural forces in accordance with natural laws into the highest regions of thinking. But in doing so, we rise above this activity. Is not our position, above all, mere conformity to natural laws, when we survey how we ourselves are integrated into nature? We see with our eyes in conformity with the laws of nature, but we also understand the laws that govern the activity of seeing. We can stand on a higher elevation and survey simultaneously the external world and ourselves in interplay. Is it not true that there is a nature active within us that is higher than the organic sensory personality? which acts according to natural laws and with natural laws. In such activity is there still a partition between our inner world and the external world. It is no longer our individual personality that judges here, that gathers insights. Rather, it is the universal essence of the world, which has torn down the barrier between inner world and outer world and which now embraces both. As it is true that I remain the same individual in external appearance when I have torn down the barrier, so it is true that in essence I am no longer this individual. The feeling now lives in me that the universal nature speaks in my soul, the nature that embraces the whole world and me. Such feelings live in Tauler when he says, quote, The human being is, as it were, three people, 
an animal being according to the senses, a rational being, and finally the highest godlike being. One is the external animal sensual being, the second is the internal rational being with rational faculties, and the third is the spirit, the highest part of the soul. Close quote. Footnote Sermons 129, 94. Tauler quotes from Julius Hamburger. Titled Johann Tauler's Predicten, Frankfurt 1864, and a footnote. Eckhart has expressed how this third being is superior to the first and second in these words, quote, The I, E-Y-E, by which I see God, is the same I with which God sees me. My I and God's I are one I, and one seeing, and one knowing, and one feeling. Close quote from Sermon 96. But in Tauler another sentiment lives alongside this one. He struggles through to a real concept of spirit. And he does not continually intermingle the sensory with the spiritual world, as do false materialists and false idealists. If Tauler, with his way of thinking, had become a scientist, he would have had to insist that everything natural, including the whole human being, the first and the second, could be explained in entirely natural terms. He would never have transferred purely spiritual forces into nature. He would not have spoken of a functionalism in nature, imagined in correspondence with human examples. He knew that where we perceive with the senses, no creative thoughts are to be found. Instead, he was unwaveringly conscious of the fact that the human being is a merely natural being, Since he felt himself to be a curator of the moral life, not a scientist, he saw the contrast that separates this natural aspect of the human being from the, in quotes, seeing of God, which arises in a natural way within the natural world, but as something spiritual. It was just in this contrast that the meaning of life appeared before his eyes, Human beings find themselves to be individual beings, creatures of nature. No science can reveal anything more to them about this life than that they are such creatures. They cannot go beyond the mere, excuse me, they cannot go beyond the state appropriate to such creatures. They must remain within it. And yet their inner life leads them beyond it. They must have confidence in a reality no science of external nature can impart. If they call this nature existence, they must be able to advance to the view that acknowledges non-existence as the higher order. Tauler does not seek a God who exists in the sense of a natural force. He does not seek a God who has created the world in the sense of human creations. He recognizes that even the concept of creation of the teachers of the Church is only an idealized human form of creating. It is clear to him that God is not found in the same manner as science finds natural processes and natural laws. Tauler knows that we cannot simply add God to nature in our thoughts. He knows that one who perceives God through the senses does not have any more in that thought than one who has apprehended nature in thought. Consequently, Tauler does not want to think God. He wants to think divinely. Knowledge of nature is not enriched by knowing God. It is transformed. A person who knows God does not know something different from the one who knows nature. Such a person knows differently. One who knows God cannot add a single letter to the knowledge of nature, but through this knowledge of nature a new light shines. The basic sensations that dominate the soul of a person who looks at the world from such points of view will depend on how this individual regards the experience of the soul brought about by spiritual rebirth. Within this experience, 
people are completely natural when they see themselves interacting with the rest of nature. And they are wholly spiritual beings when they consider the condition that results from their transformation. It may be said with equal justification, therefore, that the greatest depths of the soul are still natural and that they are at the same time divine. In conformity with his way of thinking, Towler emphasized the former. No matter how deeply we penetrate our souls, he said, we always remain individual human beings. Nevertheless, universal nature glows in the depths of the individual soul. Towler was dominated by the feeling that we cannot detach ourselves from our individuality. We cannot cleanse ourselves of it. Accordingly, the universal essence cannot appear in its purity within human beings. It can only shine into the depths of the soul. Thus only a reflection, an image of the universal essence appears. We can transform our individual personality so that it gives back the image of the universal essence. The essence itself does not shine within the human being. From such views, Towler came to the idea of a divinity that never entirely merges with the human world, never flows into it. He even expressly insists upon not being confused with those who declare the interior of the human being to be something divine in itself. He says that the union with God is thought by ignorant human beings to occur in the flesh and they say that they should be transformed into divine nature. This is an incorrect and troublesome heresy. Even in the highest and most intimate union with God, the divine nature and God's essence are high, indeed higher than all height. This leads into a divine abyss, and no creature will ever partake of it. Close quote from Sermon 72. Deservedly, Tyler wants to be called a believing Catholic, in the sense of his time and of his vocation as a priest. He is not intent upon confronting Christianity with another point of view. He simply wants to deepen and spiritualize Christianity through his views. He speaks of the contents of Scripture as a pious priest. Nevertheless, in his world of ideas, the scriptures become a means of expression for the innermost experiences of the soul. Quote, God accomplishes all his works in the soul and gives them to the soul, and the Father brings forth his only begotten Son in the soul, as truly as he brings him forth in eternity. Neither less nor more. What is brought forth when one says, quote, God brings forth in the soul? Close quote. Is it a similitude of God, or is it an image of God, or is it something else of God? It is neither image nor similitude of God, but the same God and the same Son, whom the Father brings forth in eternity. It is nothing but the lovely divine word, which is the other person in the Trinity. This does the Father bring forth in the soul, and it is from this that the soul derives such a great and special dignity. Close quote from Sermon 83. Towler viewed the narratives of the scriptures as the garment in which he would clothe the events of the inner life. Quote, Herod, who drove away the child and wanted to kill him, is an image of the world, which still wants to kill this child in the devout person. One should and must flee this world if one wants to keep the child alive within because the child is the enlightened, believing soul of every human being. Close quote from Sermon 15. Because Towler directs his attention to the natural human being, he is less concerned with describing what happens when the higher human being enters into the natural human being than with finding the paths that the lower faculties of the personality must take if they are to be translated into the higher life. As a curator of the moral life, he wants to show the human being the ways to the universal essence. 
He has absolute faith and confidence that the universal essence will begin to shine in humanity if humanity arranges life to make a place for the divine. But this universal essence can never begin to shine if human beings shut themselves off in their bare, natural, separate personalities. Isolated within themselves, in the language of Towler, human beings are only a part of the world, individual creatures. The more human beings enclose themselves within their existence as a part of the world, the less can the universal essence find a place within them. Quote, if one is to become truly one with God, all the faculties of the inner person must die and become silent. The will must be turned away from even the good and from all willing, and must become, quote, without will, close quote. People must escape all the senses, turn all their faculties inward, and become forgetful of everything, including themselves. The true and eternal word of God is spoken only in the desert, once a person has left behind the self and everything, and stands alone, deserted and solitary. Those quote from Sermon 45a. When Towler had reached his highest point, the following question became his central concern. How can people destroy and overcome their individual inner existence so that they can take part in universal life? For those who are in this situation, their feelings toward the universal essence become concentrated in only one thing, reverence for it, as for the inexhaustible and infinite. Such a person may say, quote, no matter what level one has attained, there are still higher prospects, still more sublime possibilities. Close quote. The steps such a person must take are definite and clear. It is equally clear that one can never speak of a goal. A new goal is only the beginning of a new road. With a new goal, a person has reached a certain degree of development. Development itself extends into the immeasurable. At the present level, one can never know what will be achieved at a more distant level. We cannot discern the final goal. We can only trust in the road, in the development. It is possible to arrive at knowledge of everything the human being has achieved. It consists in the penetration of an already existing object by the faculties of spirit. For the higher inner life, such knowledge does not exist. Here the faculties of the spirit must first translate the object itself into existence. They must first create an existence for it that is like the natural existence. Natural science examines the development of living beings from the simplest creature to the human being, the most perfect. This development lies completed before us. We understand it by penetrating it with our mental faculties. When development comes, one does not find its continuation, already exists. We accomplish that development ourselves. We now live what we only knew at earlier levels. We create objectively, according to our spiritual natures, what we only recreated at preceding stages. The truth does not coincide only with what exists in nature. It embraces both the naturally existent and the non-existent. This idea completely filled Tauler in all his considerations. We are told that an enlightened layperson, a, quote, friend of God from the Oberland, quote, close quote, led him to this conviction. This involves a mysterious story. There are only conjectures about the place where this friend of God lived. About whom he was, there are not even conjectures. He is said to have heard much about Towler's manner of preaching and to have decided, as a result, to go to Towler, who was then a preacher in Strasbourg, to fulfill a certain task pertaining to him. 
the relationship of Towler to the friend of God and the influence that the friend exercised on him are described in a work that is printed together with Towler's sermons in the oldest editions under the title Das Buch des Meisters, The Book of the Master. In this book, the friend of God, in whom we recognize the same one who entered into a relationship with Towler, tells of a master who has been identified as Towler himself. He tells how a revolution, a spiritual rebirth, has been brought about in a certain master, and how this master, when he felt his death approaching, called the friend to him and asked him to write the story of his, in quotes, enlightenment. He further asked that the friend take care that no one should ever discover the identity of the book's subject. He asked this because all the insights that emanate from him are yet not his alone. For, quote, for know that God has performed everything through me, poor worm that I am, and thus it is not mine, but God's, close quote, from Das Buch des Meisters. A scholarly dispute has developed in connection with this matter, but it is not at all important as far as its essentials are concerned. On the one hand, an attempt has been made to prove that the friend of God never existed, footnote, Heinrich de Niffle, titled Die Dedichtungen des Gottesfreundes im Oberlande, The Writings of the Friend of God in the Oberland, Berlin, 1880 to 1881, and a footnote. It is said that his existence was invented, and that the books attributed to him in fact originated with someone else, parenthesis, Ruhlmann Merswin, close parenthesis. Wilhelm Preger, in his History of German Mysticism, has argued in support of his existence, the genuineness of the writings, and the correctness of the facts relating to Tauler. It is not incumbent upon me to illuminate by obtrusive research this human relationship, which one who understands how to read the relevant writings will know full well is to remain a secret. It is enough to say of Towler that at a certain stage of his life a change, such as the one I am about to describe, took place in him. Here Towler's personality is no longer in question, but rather a personality, quote, in general, close quote. With regard to Towler, we are concerned only with the fact that we must come to understand the transformation in him from the perspective I will indicate. If we compare his later with his earlier activity, the fact of this transformation is immediately evident. I omit all external circumstances and relate the inner soul processes of the master under the, quote, influence of the lay person, close quote. The spiritual disposition of the reader completely determines who this lay person and master are. I do not know if my own imagination of them applies to anyone else. This master instructs his listeners about the relationship between the soul and universal essence. He explains that people no longer feel that the natural limited faculties of the individual personality are active within them when they descend into the profound depths of the soul. There, it is no longer the individual who speaks, but God. The human being there does not see God or the world. God sees himself. The human being becomes one with God. But the Master knows that this teaching has not yet come fully to life within him. He thinks it with the intellect. But he does not yet live within it with every fiber of his personality. In this way he teaches about a state that he, is not yet fully ex- that he has not yet fully experienced within himself. The description of this state corresponds to the truth, but this truth is worth nothing if it does not acquire life, if it does not take up existence in the real world. The lay person, or friend of God, hears of the Master and his teachings. He is not less penetrated with the truth the Master utters than is the Master himself. But he does not possess this truth as an intellectual idea. He possesses it as the whole force of his life. He knows that one can impart this truth when it is acquired from the outside, 
without living in its essence in the least. In that case a person has nothing within, beyond the natural understanding of the intellect. One then speaks of such natural understanding as though it were the highest truth, identical with the activity of universal essence. This is not so, because it was not acquired in a life already transformed and reborn when it approached this knowledge. The knowledge one attains as a merely natural human being remains only natural, even if one expresses the main features of the higher knowledge later in words. The transformation must come out of nature itself. Nature, which has developed to a certain stage, must be developed further by life. Something new must come into existence through this further development. One must not simply look back upon the development that has already taken place and consider what is reformed in the mind concerning this development to be the highest truth. One must instead look forward to what has not yet been created. This knowledge must be the beginning of new meaning, not an outcome of the meaning of one's previous development. Nature advances from worm to mammal, from mammal to human being, in a real process, not a conceptual one. The human being is not intended merely to repeat this process in spirit. The spiritual recapitulation is only the beginning of a new development, which is also a spiritual reality. Human beings do not just understand what nature has produced, they carry nature further. They transform their understanding into living action. They bring forth the spirit within themselves. And from then on, the spirit advances from one stage of development to another, just as nature advances. The spirit initiates a natural process on a higher level. When one who has understood this evolution speaks about the God who sees himself within the human, this utterance assumes a different character. One attaches little value to the fact that a previously achieved insight has led into the depths of the universal essence. One's spiritual disposition acquires a new character. It continues to develop in the direction determined by the universal essence. Not only is the world view of such a one different from that of the person who is merely rational, but that one also lives life differently. This person does not speak of the meaning that life already has by virtue of the forces and laws of the world. Rather, this individual gives a new meaning to life. Rational human beings do not immediately possess within themselves the higher human being that may be born any more than a fish has within itself the mammal that may appear at a later stage of development. If a fish could understand itself and its surroundings, it would believe that its, quote, fishhood, close quote, represents the meaning of life. It would say, quote, the universal essence is like a fish. Universal essence sees itself in the fish, close quote. The fish might speak in this way as long as it merely holds on firmly to its intellectual understanding. In reality, however, it does not hold on to it. In its actions it goes beyond its understanding. It becomes a reptile and later a mammal. The meaning the fish gives itself goes beyond the sense suggested to it by mere reflection. And this is how it must be for human beings. We give ourselves meaning. We do not stop at what we are and what we find reflected back to us. Understanding leaps beyond itself only when it understands itself in the right way. Understanding cannot derive the world from a prefabricated God. It must develop in a direction toward God from a seed. Those who have come to this understanding prefer not to view God as an external being. They want to treat God as a being who walks with them toward a goal, one that is just as mysterious at the outset 
as mammal nature is to a fish. They do not want to simply know the meaning or self-revealing, already existing God. They want to be friends of the divine action and operation which is superior to both existence and non-existence. The layperson who came to the Master was a friend of God in this sense. Through him the Master was transformed from a contemplator of the nature of God into, quote, one who lives in the Spirit, close quote, one who did not merely contemplate but lived in the higher sense. The Master no longer simply shared his intellectual concepts and ideas. These concepts and ideas sprang from him as living true spirit. He no longer merely edified his listeners, he moved them deeply. He no longer plunged their souls within themselves, he led them into a new life. This is related to us symbolically. We are told that through the effect of one of his sermons, forty people collapsed as though dead. Another leader into such a new life is represented in a certain work by an unknown author. Martin Luther was the first to bring it to light by publishing it. The philologist Franz Pfeiffer recently reprinted it from a manuscript of 1497, with a translation in modern German facing the original text. The introduction to the work announces its intention and goal, quote, here the Frankfurter says exceedingly deep and beautiful things of the consummate life. Close quote. This introduction is followed by a preface concerning the quote, in quotes, Frankfurter, which states, quote, What is expressed in this booklet, the omnipotent, eternal God has spoken through a wise, judicious, truthful, righteous man, his friend, who was formerly a Teutonic knight, a priest, and a custodian in the house of the Teutonic Knights in Frankfurt. It teaches many lovely insights into divine truth, and especially how one can recognize the true and righteous friends of God, as well as the unrighteous, false, free spirits, who do much harm to the Holy Church. Close quote. Footnote Franz Pfeiffer, titled Theologia, Deutsch, Stuttgart, 1855, and a footnote. Free spirits, in quotes, may be taken to mean those who live in a world of ideas like that of the Master described earlier, before his transformation, by the friend of God. The, quote, true and righteous friends of God, close quote, are those who think in the way of the layperson. We can further ascribe to the book the intention of having the same effect on its readers as the friends of God from the Oberland had upon the Master. We do not know the author, but what does this mean? We do not know when he was born, when he died, and what he did in ordinary life. It is integral to the way the author wanted to work that the facts of his outer life should remain forever secret. It is not the, in quotes, self of this or that human being, born at a certain time, that is to speak to us, but the selfhood on the basis of which the, quote, particularity of the individualities, close quote, first develops, in the sense of the words of Paul Asmus. Footnote, Paul Asmus, see page 27 of this book, end of footnote. Quote, Imagine God receiving unto himself all those who exist now, and all those, those who have ever been, and in them becoming human, and imagine that they too become God in him. If this did not also happen in me, my fall and my estrangement would not be remedied until it indeed happened in me as well. And in this restoration and improvement I can and should do nothing but only and purely submit to what is done, so that God alone accomplishes everything within me. And I yield to him and all his works and his divine will, but if I do not want to become transformed and instead cling to attributes of the self, that is to, in quotes, my and, in quotes, I, to, in quotes, me and so on, then God is hindered. He cannot accomplish his work within me, pure and alone and without obstacle. Accordingly, my fall and my estrangement remain unremedied. 
close quote. Footnote, Julius Pfeiffer, uh, titled Theologia, Deutsch, pages 11 and 13, and a footnote. The Frankfurter does not intend to speak as an individual. He wants to allow God to speak. Of course, he knows that he can do this only as an individual personality, but he is a friend of God. That is, one who does not want to depict the nature of life through contemplation, but wants to point out, through the living spirit, the beginning of an avenue of development. The discussions in the book represent various instructions on how this road is to be attained. The basic idea is that human beings are to cast off everything connected with the belief that they are separate individualities. This idea seems to be carried out only with respect to the moral life. It must also be applied to the life of higher understanding. One must root out in oneself what appears as separateness. Then independent existence ceases, universal life enters us. We cannot possess universal life by drawing it to us. It comes into us when we silence the separate existence within us. We possess universal life least of all when we regard our individual existence as if universal life already reposed within it. It appears in the individual existence only when the individual existence does not claim that it is a distinct entity. The book calls this claim of individual existence the, quote, assumption, close quote, Ibid, pages 7 and 9. Through this assumption, the self makes it impossible for universal life to enter it. The self then puts itself in the place of the whole as a part, as something incomplete. Quote, the whole comprises and embraces all beings. Without and outside this whole there is no true being. All things have their being in the whole, for it is the essence of all things, and is in itself unchangeable and immovable, and changes and moves all other things. But the world of divided and incomplete beings arose from the whole, or what it becomes, in the same way as the brilliance or luminosity emanating from the sun or from a light appears as a distinct entity. This entity is called, quote, creature, close quote, and none of these separate entities is identical with the whole. Therefore the whole also is not identical with any of the separate entities. When the whole appears, one rejects what is distinct and separate. But when does it appear? I say it is when it is known, felt, and tasted in the soul, in so far as it is possible. The lack is wholly in us, and not in it. Even though the sun illuminates the whole world, and even though it is as close to one person as to another, one who is blind nevertheless cannot see it. That is not a defect in the sun, but rather in the blind person. If my eye is to see something, it must be cleansed of or freed from all other things. One must ask, insofar as the whole is unknowable and incomprehensible for all creatures, and the soul is a creature, how can it be known in the soul? The answer is this. The creature is to be known as creature. Close quote. I bid pages 3, 5, and 7. This is like saying that everything creature should be regarded as creature nature and as created, and that it should not regard itself as an I, capital, with selfhood, which makes knowing it impossible. Quote, in the creature in which the complete is to be known, creatureness, created being, I, selfhood, and so on, must be lost and amount to nothing. Close quote. Footnote, the works of the Frankfurter, chapter 1, and a footnote. Thus, the soul must look to itself. There it will find its I-being or selfhood. If it stops there, it separates itself from the whole. If it regards its selfhood only as something loaned to it, as it were, and obliterates it in spirit, the stream of the universal life, the whole, will seize it. Quote, Let us say that a creature takes on something good, such as being, life, knowledge, 
insight, capacity. In other words, all that one would call good and deems that it, as a creature, is that attribute or that the attribute belongs to it or is part of it. As long as this happens, such a creature rejects itself. There are two eyes in the created soul of the human being, E-Y-E. One has the possibility of looking into eternity, the other of looking into time and into the creature. People should stand in freedom, without selfhood, I, me, my, and so on, so that there are no more self-seeking and self-determining than if they did not exist. People should also value themselves as if they did not exist and as though someone else had accomplished all their works. Close quote, Ibid, pages 9, 25, 51, and 53. It must be understood that the concepts that the author of these words articulates through his higher ideas, and feelings are those of a devout priest of his time. It is not a matter of the conceptual content but of the direction, not of the ideas but of the spiritual disposition. A person who does not live within Christian dogma as this author does, but within the concepts of natural science, lends other meanings to those words. But with the other meanings those words point in the same direction. This direction leads to overcoming selfhood through selfhood itself. It is within the self that the highest light shines for the human being. This light gives the right reflection to the world of ideas only when the human being is aware that it is not the light of the self but the universal light of the world. Consequently, there is no more important knowledge than self-knowledge, and at the same time there is none that so completely leads beyond itself. When the self knows itself in the right way, it is no longer a self. That particular author expresses it this way, quote, For God's nature is without individual aspects and without selfhood and I-being. But the nature and peculiarity of the creature is that it seeks and determines itself, and what belongs to it and its particular characteristics. From everything that it does or leaves undone, it wants to receive profit and advantage. But where the creature, or human being, loses its own being and selfhood and goes beyond the self, there God enters with his being and with his selfhood. Close quote, Ibid, page 87. We ascend from a concept of the self in which the self appears as essence, to a concept in which we see it as a mere organ where universal essence acts upon itself. In line with the ideas of our book, it is said, If people can reach the point where they belong as much to God as their hands belong to them, they can rest content and seek no further. Close quote, Ibid, page 233. This does not mean that one being should stop at a certain point in development. When one has gone as far as these words indicate, one should no longer pursue investigations about the meaning of the hand, but instead use the hand so that it serves the body to which it belongs. Quote, genius of soul, close quote, would be the proper way to describe the spiritual disposition of Heinrich Suso and Jan van Ruy's book. Footnote, Jan van Ruy's book, uh, 1293-1381, to Roman Catholic mystic, born Brabant, now in Belgium and the Netherlands. He was an Augustinian canon. In his middle age, he retired to a hermitage at Kronendal, near Brussels, where he was prior of a small community. His sanctity and good counsel attracted visitors from afar, and Johannes Tauler and Gerhard Gut were among his followers. His influence on Groot was so great that Tauler is considered a forerunner of the Brothers of the Common Life. Heinrich Zuso, 1295-1366, German mystic and Dominican friar. While studying in Köln, he was influenced by Meister Eckhart, whose writings he defended against charges of heresy. He became a popular preacher associated with Johannes Tauler. At first harshly ascetic, he gradually emphasized detachment rather than mortification as central in the Christian discipline. 
His mysticism was expressed in terms of the contemporary literary romantic cult of the Minnesingers, which gave him the epithet Sweet Zuso. He was beatified in 1831. End of footnote. Their feelings were drawn by an impulse resembling instinct toward the same point to which Eckhart's and Tauler's feelings were led through a higher life of ideas. Zuso's heart turns ardently toward a primordial essence that embraces the individual human being, as well as the whole remaining world, and in which, forgetting himself, he wants to be absorbed like a drop of water in the great ocean. He speaks of this yearning for the universal essence not as something he wants to grasp in his thoughts. He speaks of it as a natural impulse that intoxicates his soul with the desire for the annihilation of his separate existence and for rebirth in the all-embracing activity of infinite essence. Quote, Turn your eyes toward this being in its pure simplicity and let go of this or that which only participates in being. Take being alone in itself, which is not mixed with non-being. But just as non-being negates all being, so being in itself is the negation of all non-being. A thing that is yet to come about, or has already been, is not at this moment really existing as being. Now, one can know mixed being or non-being only by referring them to total being. It is not a divided being of this or that creature, because divided being is all mixed together with some otherness of potency to receive something. Therefore the nameless divine being must be in itself complete being that supports all divided beings with its presence. Close quote, footnote, Heinrich Zusso, the exemplar, titled The Exemplar, with two German sermons, page 191. And a footnote. Thus speaks Zusso in the autobiography he composed with the aid of his disciple Elsbeth Steglin. He too was a devout priest and lived fully in the Christian realm of ideas. He lived in it as if it were completely unthinkable for someone with his spiritual direction to live in a different spiritual world. It is also true that one can associate another conceptual significance with his spiritual direction. This is clearly indicated by the way the content of the Christian doctrine becomes an inner experience for him, while his relationship to Christ becomes one between his spirit and the eternal truth of a purely conceptual spiritual kind. He wrote titled Little Book of Eternal Wisdom, in which he allowed eternal wisdom to speak to its servant, presumably himself. Quote, Don't you recognize me? Have you sunk so low, or are you faint from your immense sorrow? My dear child, it is I, gentle, merciful wisdom, who, while remaining hidden to all the saints in my innermost depths, have opened up wide the abyss of my mercy to receive you and all penitent hearts kindly. It is I, dear wisdom, who became poor and outcast, so that I might return to your true dignity. It is I who suffered a bitter death in order to let you live again. I stand here now, pale, bloody, and loving, as I stood on the high gallows of the cross, mediating between you and the stern judgment of my father. It is I, your brother, your husband. I shall forget everything that you have ever done to me, as though it had never happened if only you will completely turn to me alone and never again leave me. Close quote. As we can see, everything material and temporal in the Christian view of the world has become for Zuso a spiritual, ideal process within his soul. From some chapters of the autobiography of Zuso, it might appear as if he had let himself be led not by the mere activity of his own spiritual faculties, but by external revelations, by spirit-like visions. But he clearly expresses his opinion about this. One attains the truth only by exercise of reason, not through revelation. Quote, I shall also tell you how to distinguish between pure truth and dubious visions originating in sense knowledge. 
direct sight of the naked Godhead. This is pure, genuine truth without any doubts. And every vision, the more intellectual and free of images it is, and the more like this same pure seeing, the nobler it is. Close quote. Meister Eckhart also leaves no doubt that he rejects the view that sees the spirit in substantial spatial forms, in apparitions that can be perceived in the same way as sensory ones. Spirits like Zuso and Eckhart are opponents of a view such as that expressed in the spiritualism that developed in the 18th century. Jan van Ruysbroek walked the same paths as Zuso. Footnote, Jan van Ruysbroek's mystical treatises are classics of Middle Dutch literature and Christian mysticism. His works include titled The Seven Steps of the Ladder of Spiritual Love and titled The Spiritual Espousals. He was beatified in 1908. End of footnote. His spiritual road found a spirited opponent in Jean de Gerson, 1363-1429, to who was for some time Chancellor of the University of Paris and played an important role at the Council of Constance. Footnote. By the election of Martin V as Pope, November 11, 1417, the Council of Constance ended the Great Schism but did not have time to reform. The Council issued two canons, that represented the high points of conciliar thought. The first canon, Sacrosancta, declared that the Council of Constance derives its power directly from Christ and that its authority is superior even to that of the See of Rome. The second canon, Frequens, called for the frequent invocation of future councils to promote reform. A list of abuses to be addressed was also issued. Later popes largely nullified the intended results perhaps laying the path to the Reformation. End of footnote. It throws light on the nature of the mysticism cultivated by Tauler, Zusso and Wiesbruck if one compares it with the mystical endeavors of Gerson, whose predecessors were Richard of St. Victor, Bonaventura and others. Footnote. St. Bonaventura, 1217-1274, to born Giovanni. He became a Franciscan and later a professor of theology in Paris. He was named Bishop of Albano by Gregory X. He was known for his great devotion and wisdom and for revitalizing the Franciscan order. He was canonized in 1482. End of footnote. Ruysbroek himself fought against those whom he counted among the heretical mystics. He believed heretical mystics to be all those who, on the basis of an unconsidered intellectual judgment, hold all things to be the emanation of one primordial essence, and who thus see in the world only a diversity, and in God the unity of that diversity. Louise Brooke did not count himself among those mystics. He knew that one cannot reach the primordial essence by contemplating the things themselves, but only by raising from this lower to a higher way of thinking. Similarly, he turned against those who, without further ado, wanted to see a higher nature in the individual human being, in separate existence, in our creatureness. He very much lamented the error that eliminates all differences in the sensory world, and says lightly that things merely appear to be different, whereas in fact they are all essentially the same. For a way of thinking such as Ruiz Brooks, this would be the same as if one were to say, quote, it is of no concern to us that our eyes see trees along an avenue converge in the distance. The fact is that they remain equally distant, and so our eyes must adjust to see them correctly. Close, close, close quote. But our eyes do see correctly. The trees do converge, owing to a necessary law of nature. And we should not oppose this way of seeing, but understand why we see in this way. Neither do mystics turn away from objects of the senses, but accept them as sensory, as they are. And it is clear to them that such phenomena cannot become something else through my intellectual judgment. But in the spirit they go beyond the senses and reason, and only then do mystics find unity. They have an unshakable belief that they can develop to the point of seeing this unity. Therefore they ascribe to human nature the divine spark 
that can be made to shine within on its own. It is different with those of Gerson's kind. They do not believe that this shining is intrinsic. For them, what human beings can see always remains an external reality that must, they, that must approach them outwardly from one side or the other. Ruizbrook believed that the highest wisdom must become apparent to mystical vision. Gerson believed only that the soul could illuminate the content of an external teaching, that of the Church. Gerson saw mysticism as merely having a warm feeling for everything that is revealed in this teaching. To Ruizbrook it was a belief that the content of this teaching is also born in the soul. Gerson reproves Ruizbrook for imagining not only that he possesses the capacity to see the universal essence with clarity, but also that an activity of the universal essence manifests itself in this vision. Gerson simply could not understand Gray's book. They were speaking two different things, speaking of two different things. Gray's book had his eye fixed on the life of the soul that lives its God. Gerson sees only a life of the soul that wants to love a God to whom it never will be able to give life. Like so many others, Gerson too fought against a foreign idea only because it would not fit his, his experience. Addendum 1923 In my writings I speak of mysticism in various ways. People have claimed to find what seems to them a contradiction in this. This is explained in the annotations to the new edition of my title Theory of Knowledge in Goethe's Conception of the World. End of this part on Johannes Tauler.